Wayne Grudem wrote the following in Systematic Theology, which I encourage everyone to own. The blood of Christ is the clear outward evidence that his lifeblood was poured out when he died, a sacrificial death to pay for our redemption. The blood of Christ means his death in its saving aspects. Although we may think that Christ's blood, as evidence that his life had been given, would have exclusive reference to the removal of our judicial guilt before God, for this is its primary reference, the New Testament authors also attribute to it several other effects. By the blood of Christ, our consciences are cleaned. We learned about that last week. We gain bold access to God in worship and in prayer. We're going to learn about that very soon in Hebrews 10. We are progressively cleansed from remaining sin. We learn about that all over the New Testament. We are able to conquer the accuser of the brethren, and we are rescued out of a sinful way of life. Grudem continues, Scripture speaks so much about the blood of Christ because its shedding was very clear evidence that his life was being given in judicial execution. That is, he and by God himself in heaven. Scriptures emphasize on the, on the blood of Christ. Scripture's emphasis on the blood of Christ also shows the clear connection between Christ's death and the many sacrifices in the Old Testament that involved the pouring out of the lifeblood of sacrificial animals. We learned about that last week. These sacrifices all pointed forward to and prefigured the death of Christ. It was all about Jesus. The entire Old Testament was foreshadowing Jesus so that when he arrived to pay for sin by the shedding of his blood, the world would have evidence that it was the will of God to allow his son to suffer for us, and it was always the will of God to give his son to suffer for us, for our benefit and for God's glory. It was all, always about Jesus. And the author of Hebrews has been saying that all along. It has always all been about Jesus. And last week, we began by focusing on what chapter 9 focuses on heavily, which is his blood. And we've divided it into two sermons because everything I just read from Grudem, you would think, okay, I'm going to have to buy that book and read that again. Because every sentence was rich with truth. Every sentence in what I just read could take a week to really unpack and think about contemplate, and pour over your sin in your life so it can have its intended effect, which is why we don't rush through any book of the Bible. We take our time and study it as we believe it needs to be. But this week, we come to the blood of Christ, the power of the blood of Christ, part two, dealing with two more significant things that the blood of Christ does, or shall I say, two significant problems for us that the blood of Christ solves. This book has been deep, very deep. And even as I have gotten this far into it, I think, oh, I wish I could go back and re-preach some sermons. I do, but I won't. <laughs> it's been preached. <laughs> and unless God leads me to Hebrews again way later in my pastorate, way later, it won't happen again anytime soon. But you can just, as you're unpacking it, you get to chapter 9 and you circle a word and you go, oh my goodness, this is what chapter 6 was talking about. This is where the author was headed. And I just hope that as we've studied, and especially if you're in a life group, I do trust you're doing that. Your group is unpacking things and drawing connections that I don't have the time to in 45 to 50 minutes on Sunday. I couldn't possibly unpack every word and circle it and draw lines back through the book to chapter one and two and three and four and show you that it's all one gigantic argument that is still saying it has always been about Jesus. Your entire Old Testament is always about Jesus. So as we turn today to the second half of chapter nine, looking at the topic of the blood of Christ, I want you to see first, as we're looking at, at the topic of his blood, as, as blood relates to whatever sacrificial system is occurring, whatever covenant is enacted at a specific point in human history, 
when we go to the Old Covenant, we need to see this. Number one, the Old Covenant could not facilitate the bequeathal of the Abrahamic promise. I'm going to give you a second to write that down. There are six points today. You might have to pause, eat lunch, and come back for the rest of the sermon. But there are six today. First one is this, that the Old Covenant could not facilitate the bequeathal of the Abrahamic promise. I don't have time to unpack for you the Abrahamic promise. I did that in a prior sermon. So if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, all these sermons end up there, usually by Sunday night, if not Sunday, then by Monday. And you can go back and learn about the Abrahamic promise. We learned about that back in in chapter 7 or so. And it, it was intended for the Abrahamic promise, the promise God made to Abraham to have such an immense blessing attached to it that all the lineage of Abraham received, they became heirs to the blessing. They would be bequeathed the blessing. Now, bequeathal is a really interesting word, and you'll see why I use it if we go to the text. So let's go to the text, verses 15 through 17. Therefore, Jesus, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called by or who are called, may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeemed them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Meaning they couldn't receive the bequeathal, they couldn't receive eternal inheritance if their sin wasn't covered. It was through the forgiveness of sins they could become the heirs of the Abrahamic promise. People whose sin is not atoned for can't inherit that promise and the blessings of the Abrahamic promise. So he had to do something to mediate them being forgiven and thereby becoming inheritors of eternal blessing, we'll say. So keep reading with me. Keep keep tracking with me. Verse 16, for where a will is involved, a will, like you know what a will is. Some of you have wills, and in your will it might say something like, I bequeath to my firstborn son my whole library. uh, Caleb's not even paying attention. (laughs) You didn't hear it, so it's not binding. But it might be in a will that you have that you bequeath certain things to certain people upon your death. And that's the type of will this is talking about. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will only takes effect what? When? When a death has occurred since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. So if I have a will and in it says, if God, if Jesus has a a will, so to speak, and in it it says, upon my death, those who believe in me will inherit all blessings, will inherit eternal life, will inherit me, will inherit fellowship with me, communion with me, and all sorts of blessings that come along with Jesus, knowing Jesus, then it wasn't until he died, the will became active, became Binding. That's what the author's trying to say. So let me go back now to verse 15, where it says, therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, with the result being so that we can get eternal life. Flip that. Flip the coin. What does it also mean? That the old covenant couldn't produce eternal inheritance which was my first point. That's why the first point is what it is. The old covenant, the sacrifice of animals yearly for the atonement of the sins of Israel could not induct the bequeathal of the Abrahamic promise to the people it was promised to. It took a different covenant to pull that off. Why? Because I want you to, I want you to, uh, to uh, circle Where is it? Since a death has occurred, that does what? Circle this, redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So long as the old covenant was was stable and active and a new covenant hadn't come along yet, there was no way for people to become blessed according to the promise of Abraham. Now, where am I getting this? Why am I getting this? Are we really talking about Abraham? Because Pastor Mike, I don't see the word Abraham there. And that would be totally valid of you to say. If you haven't thought it, think it now. Are you sure he's talking about the Abrahamic promise? Eternal 
inheritance. I want you to key in on eternal inheritance. The only times in the book of Hebrews that the word heir, H-E-I-R, or inheritance or will is used, it's regarding the Abrahamic promise. So this is where I say, I wish I could go circle everything in your book, in your Bible, and show you just the litany of like all my wrinkled pages and all that I've got going on here, but it all connects for me. I see everything is connected like a spider web. That word, uh, occur, uh, eternal inheritance, is still talking about Hebrews 6.17. And Hebrews 6.17 says this. For people swear by something greater than themselves. You remember talking about the oath a few weeks ago? And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, that's us, the heirs of the promise of Abraham, in context, this is talking about Abraham, he wanted to show the unchangeable character of his purpose. He guaranteed it with an oath. He attached his name to the Abrahamic promise and swore to Abraham in Genesis 22, swearing it with an oath, I will bless your people. I will bless your descendants. And if you go back to that sermon, the big picture is through Abraham came who? Isaac, Jacob, who became Israel, had a son named Judah, so and so and so and so and so and so on, until Jesus. Jesus is from the lineage of Abraham. And through Jesus, both Jew and Gentile, meaning whether you're from the biological lineage of Abraham or not, you get Jesus. You get redemption. You get reconciliation with your God. So the Abrahamic promise is way more than a biological thing. It's not just a land thing. It had some other stuff in there, but it contains this promise for all people that there will be an eternal inheritance. It cannot be taken from you. And that eternal inheritance came through the new covenant. The old covenant couldn't pull it off. So next point, on the flip side of that, the blood of Christ secured the bequeathal of the Abrahamic promise. Because God uses that illustration like a will, having a will, my last will and testament. Well, Jesus's was, upon my death, my people shall receive eternal life if they trust in me. So the first major problem here is the inadequacy of the old covenant. One of its faults is that the Abrahamic promise couldn't be fulfilled in the old covenant. It took the new covenant and the blood of Christ specifically, the blood of Christ specifically to make possible us receiving eternal life. So think about what we said last week when I was talking about the shedding of the blood of Christ, the letting of the blood of Christ. Christ lets his blood out. That is the giving of his life. The text we used earlier said life, used the term lifeblood. We're going to use that a couple of times today. Lifeblood. Leviticus, someone is in their blood. So when Jesus lets his blood out, that is the giving of his life in your place, which is a covenant he's making with you. The contract is, I will give my life in place of your life. I will shed my blood in the place of your life being required of you. I will pay the penalty of death. And Romans 6.23 tells us the penalty of death of sin is death. So the, the, he pays the penalty of sin. He suffers on our behalf like Isaiah prophesied way before Jesus. So he does all these things. And then when he dies, the will becomes binding. And the person who believes in him is symbolically holding up a will and saying, I'm an inheritor. I've become an heir because of his death. These things have become binding. And by professing belief in his name, I'm, I'm an heir. I'm an heir of the Abrahamic promise. Just when you think the author has moved on from Abraham, he makes another point. Another reason I think this is John and not Paul, because this is the way John writes. John just hits you in chapter three of 1 John with something he was talking about in one little phrase in chapter one. You don't have to believe that though. You can think it's Paul and I'm completely fine with that. Abraham, think about Abraham in the desert. He repeat, do you remember how he received his promise? With great patience and faith, he waited on the promise. And it is so fitting. How do you receive the new covenant? With great patience and with faith. You take it by faith the same way Abraham did. Abraham had faith that the promise would come true. We have faith that the promise has come true. Listen to that. Abraham had faith that the promise would come true. We have faith that the promise has come true. 
Number three, another problem is that the temple system demonstrated the necessity of blood sacrifice in securing God's forgiveness. And that's a problem because are we supposed to go on literally for eternity sacrificing animals? Some people believe there will be reinstituted blood, uh, blood animal sacrifice in heaven. I can't shake my head no hard enough to that one. What does that say about the non-eternality of the sacrifice of Christ? That's going to look great on the video. The temple system demonstrated for us the necessity, though, of blood sacrifice in securing God's forgiveness. It showed us there are no if, ands, or bloods, buts. There must be blood given. There must be blood given for sin to be forgiven. Let's read verses 18 through 22. Starting verse 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been given, declared by Moses to all the people, Moses took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and with hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. Listen to that. That's so key. That's what he's really trying to say. Remember, under the old covenant, under the law, almost everything had to be purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. He's saying this to a Hebrew person. He's saying, remember, we've been seeing it all along. That blood is key to the forgiveness of sins. There can be no forgiveness of sins without the sacrifice of blood. So he's coming back here after briefly talking about the inheritance. He comes back to talking about the blood because the blood is how the inheritance is given. Through the letting of blood, the will becomes active. So he hasn't changed subjects. He's still talking about the blood. But I want to I show you what he's talking about really quick from Exodus 24, verses 3 through 8. This is actually where this happened, where the covenant is confirmed. Moses came and he, do we have it? Exodus 24. I'd rather you see it while I'm reading it. Exodus 24. Do we have that? I'll begin reading it. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules And all the people answered with one voice, and they all said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So they weren't forced into this. They said, we'll do it. The Lord's making a covenant with us. We will do it. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, verse 4. He rose early in the morning, and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain. There was no tabernacle yet. and the 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and sprinkled the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the blood of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the peop- the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Listen to that one more time. Behold the blood of the covenant. This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So even the old covenant, like the author of Hebrews says, even the old covenant was not inaugurated, was inaugurated with blood. Both covenants are inaugurated with blood, lest you think that blood wasn't involved. Both of them began with the shedding of blood. Do you see that? Back when the Israelites first received the law and said, we will do it. What what God has said, we will do, we will be obedient. He sprinkled blood to symbolically say it is active now that the blood of these, of these animals will be the thing that ratified the covenant. I want you to think of Jesus at the Last Supper. 
Whereas Moses said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. Jesus said, on that night, he took the cup and he said, behold, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is for you. Ooh, how different is that? The old covenant, this is the blood that the Lord has made in accordance with these words. And in the new covenant, it's this is the blood that was shed for you. That is so, it might be subtle, but remember in the old covenant, it's this is the blood and now they're gonna have to uphold it through obedience to the covenant. The, the game isn't over. You might remember from last week or the week before we were talking about the fact that the new covenant is unconditional. So when Jesus said, this is my blood share, given for you, it is the new covenant in my blood. He's ratifying. And when he did it on the cross is when it was really ratified, when it was really spilt, when he died, he ratified the new covenant in his own blood. And the author wants us to see, again, it was always all about Jesus. When we did these things in the Old Testament, it was preparing us to accept that Jesus would be our final sacrifice, the last one. And we didn't have to do it. We didn't have to sacrifice him, even though he had some people driving the nails in. Jesus went willingly to the slaughter to be murdered, to be sacrificed. This new covenant is beautiful. Both covenants are ratified in blood. And that by, by setting that ground, the author is now going to tell us three benefits that the new covenant has, that the, the blood of Christ has, that is better than the blood of those animals that was sprinkled that day at the base of Mount Sinai. Because the author wants, at this point, he wants the people reading to say, okay, so there was Mount Sinai, there was at the base of the mountain an altar built, the the Old covenant was ratified with the sprinkling of blood on the people and on everything. Everything got covered in blood as much as we possibly could. And then we see that Jesus let his blood died on a cross, ratifying a new covenant. We're going to compare the two now. Because lest we think blood is blood, which it's not, he's going to elevate the blood of Christ and show us how special the blood of Christ, the blood that ran who through his veins was not cursed by sin. And he's gonna show us at least three ways here, three things that point that stick out to me like a sore thumb that I want you to see. The blood of Christ was suitable to be brought into the heavenly places. That's number four. The old system demonstrated to us that blood sacrifice was necessary in securing God's forgiveness. But we know the faults. We know the, tempor the temporary nature of those sacrifices and how they had to keep repeating year after year. But the blood of Christ was suitable to be brought into the heavenly places, not just, not just sprinkled on earth. Read with me, verses 23 and 24. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things the tabernacle, to be purified with these rites. It was necessary for the earthly copies. A few chapters ago, you remember, the tabernacle is a shadow. It's a copy. We're meant to see that this is a temporary version of a really heavenly thing that's happening when Jesus enters the Holy of Holies as the slain Lamb of God. But when it was on earth, the tabernacle, it was right for the tabernacle to be purified in these ways. But... The heavenly places, the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So think about this. Why, why is the author saying this? Because he wants us to see that in the heavenly places where sin is finally forgiven, if Jesus had showed up and said, I didn't bring my own blood, but I, I, bought, I brought a, a bowl of lamb's blood. I brought a bowl of, of bull's blood. I brought a bowl of goat's blood. Would that have been sufficient? No, because that was suitable when we're sprinkling the copies, when we're sprinkling the things that symbolically represent the forgiveness of sin. But when it comes to the heavenly places where Jesus is about to die and resurrect and ascend into the heavenly places, he's got to show up with something better. Verse 23 unequivocally says that the blood of Jesus is pure in a way no one else, no other being's blood is pure because it was suitable for the heavenly places. Verse 24, for Christ has entered into the holy places made, not, uh, made with hand. Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands where are copies of the true things, but I underlined like so much here. 
into the heaven itself. Now, to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Oh, do I urge you to go back and I, li, listen to old sermons. Listen to chapter 4 and 5 and 6 of this series because Jesus went into the Holy of Holies. He showed up. He passed through the... I gotta go read it. I love it too much not to go back and re, reread it to you. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. With blood earnestness, he gave his life and bought us. And the will became active that we would inherit eternal life and every spiritual blessing. Through Jesus, he went through the heavens and into the holy places with his own blood slain, uh, given. When Revelation 19 shows him coming back, what's the imagery? Do you remember the imagery? The end of his robe, still dipped in blood. Because that sacrifice will ring in eternity. Forever and ever and ever. Our Jesus giving his life on the cross will ring throughout all eternity. It will never, ever, ever become something that in heaven grows old. That becomes an old story of ages past that is no longer relevant. Him giving that blood that is suitable to go into the heavenly places. I don't know how to tell you other than the ways I already have is so special, so pure. And so because of my sin, the blood of Christ was suitable to be brought into the heavenly places. And had Jesus brought some other blood, it would have accomplished nothing. But when he brought his own blood, we know what it accomplished. We would say everything, the solution to every problem accomplished. Number two, or number five, really, the blood of Christ was suitable to be offered once, once for sins. It could be offered once for sins. Why is that significant? Listen, remember the Hebrew audience, when there's blood sacrifice, how often is it? There's one major day a year, and then there's offerings throughout the year. Verse 25, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly. So it wasn't to go into the tabernacle, the temporarily, temporary copy shadow of the tabernacle, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly. He doesn't have to die on the cross over and over again. As, as the high priest, the holy, the holy places every year with the blood, enters the holy places with the blood, not of his own. For then, Jesus would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. That is so key. I don't have time to go off on a tangent with you. But if you've ever wondered, how are people in the Old Testament saved? How do they actually get to heaven? This verse just said they still have access to the Father through the blood of the Lamb. They might look out their windshield toward the cross and we look in our rearview mirror, but everyone throughout human history has relationship with the Father through the blood of the Lamb. And that is a supernatural, hard-to-grasp thing because we are beings who are stuck in time. But God is not. He's eternal by the giving of his son. And, and here's how you know that. Think logically through what this just said. If it was necessary for Jesus, if it was necessary for Jesus to die over and over again, like the bulls were sacrificed every year, he would have had to start doing it when the foundations of the world were set. When Adam and Eve first fell, Jesus would have needed to start dying every year, over and over, so that we could place our faith in him. But there's something particular about his sacrifice. There's something particular about his blood. There's something supernaturally, otherworldly, overpoweringly wonderful and sacred and consecrated about his blood. That one sacrifice would make it to where from the foundations of the world until the, the glorious day of his coming, all people would have access to God through faith in either the coming Messiah or the Messiah that we believe already came. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
at the end of the ages. That's a difficult term to, to unpack here, but I, I want you to think of it this way. His first coming 2,000 years ago was his coming at the end of the ages because we're in the end of the ages. Since the apostles wrote, we've been in the end of the ages, and Jesus came at the end of the ages. It might seem like he is just taking his time coming back, but he is, he is patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he's, but he's coming soon. But he stands at the end. He came at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And in doing so, he still stands here at the end of the ages because since his death, his death and resurrection, have they not rang out very clearly to the ends of the earth? Has anyone else's death ever been so known? We, we might think there's so many people who still haven't heard, and that's true. That's why we need evangelism and missions and a, a, a mind that thinks worldwide to take the gospel. But has any death ever penetrated human history and caused this much hubbub, like my mom would say? This much? No. Because he appeared at the end and is still standing at the end so long as the word keeps getting professed. He's still standing here today. He's in your heart, many of you, testifying that these things are true. They're worth staking your whole eternity on. He is still standing at the end of the ages. God. And his blood was suitable to be offered once. Think about it this way. In one sacrifice on the cross, Jesus accomplished what the sacrifice of bulls for eternity would not have accomplished. The sacrifice of animals for an eternity could not accomplish what God accomplished in one sacrifice of his only son. And you know this because it's where the author started the inadequacy of the old covenant to bring these things about. It was only the shed of, shedding of his son's pure blood that these things could come about, that we could gain eternal life and inheritance. Now, I want to say one quick note about how the original audience would have wrestled with this and why they would have wrestled with this. Because from this side of history, we think God gave his son, that son gave his blood in my place. And the reason this chapter would have been Oh, I can only imagine. This has been something they would have had to read over and over again and by great faith take it as truth because they live on the side of human history where human sacrifice was what the foreign nations did. They were told never to sacrifice a baby. Read about Mount Carmel. They were told never to let a person be sacrificed. They were told we sacri their sacrificial system was about animals. So the son of God coming in human form and a human sacrifice might have been something that a Hebrew person would have had to take by great faith. That after all this time of putting off being like the other nations, are we supposed to become? So remember, though you might say naturally, yes, because I've never had to sacrifice an animal yet. And I'm, most of us are probably glad we live on this side of human history where that's not something we have to think about. But we live in the same day of human sacrifice being normal. Um, so it should still wreck us all the same. I just want to say that before we proceed to the last blessing of the blood of Christ, which is this. The blood of Christ is a promise that if you trust in him, you will meet him again one day. The blood of Christ is a promise that if you trust in him, you will meet him one day. And really, we will all meet him. I mean, this is, uh, I, I could add to it, it's a promise that you will meet him on good terms one day. You will meet him unashamed one day. You will meet him without the fear of judgment one day. Let's read the text, 26b through 28. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. This time, though, will he deal with sin? No, not to deal with sin. Because his first coming was to de deal with sin. 
What did, what did the last verse say? He came the first time to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And this second time, what will he do? He will save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Literally the only thing that stands between you and the judgment for your sins is the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. He came, the way this, this text puts it is, he came once at the end of the ages to deal with sin, but to put away sin by the sacrificing of himself. But we're meant to see that, that is a, that's a past thing, but it doesn't negate that there is a future you have with Christ too. Because he is standing at the end of the ages and he's standing at the end of your life waiting to greet you. Either on good terms because you've believed in him. He has died for your sins. You profess that he is king. Like Romans 10, 9, you believe that, that he is the lamb of God. You believe he is God and that God raised him from the dead. You find yourself confessing it with your mouth. It's so true to you. You find it pulsating in your heart and it's in your veins because it's so true to you. It can't help but fall out of, of you. Like Jesus said, what's in a man's heart will come out of him. You find yourself, I'm professing Jesus Christ. If that's you by the end of your life, there's a very good chance, an almost 100% certain chance, assuming your heart's not deceiving you, that you will meet him and be on great terms. Not because of anything great you've done. Remember, we're talking about confessing your sin to the one who died for them. And he bids you to come confess, repent, believe, Trust me, I died for you. I let it all out for you. It's yours. I gave it for you. I gave my life so that you could have yours. And we're meant to see that he will come a second time because there's, there's only two ways you're getting out of this world. You ever thought about that? A lot of us say there's a 100% chance that every man will die one day, and that's 50-50 chance because you don't know if Jesus will come back in your lifetime. So really, there's two ways we are getting out of this world. One of them is death. The other is if you're still alive when he comes back. The Bible teaches we profess a literal second coming of Christ because of passages like this, that we, we're not just waiting around here. Something is going to happen. There will be an end of this age where it will be too late. It'll be too late to repent. There will be a glorious second coming. Scripture calls it the day of the Lord. And it's all throughout the New Testament. There's no denying that he is coming again. And we're meant to see that he's standing there at the end of the age. I am going to meet him. I'm going to meet my creator one day. This is the reality. Jesus is waiting on you. Every one of you. I wish I could take time for eye contact with every single one of you. Jesus is waiting on you. If you, that means he's waiting on you to repent of your sins for the first time. He's waiting on you to pray, place your faith in him. If you don't know how to repent and if you don't feel sorry for your sin, don't let that stand in the way. Have faith in the lamb of God. Have faith that these things have occurred. Have faith that he is waiting for you at the end of the ages and let him teach you over time about the decrepitness of your sin. Jesus is waiting on some of you for lack of a better phrase, to recommit your life. You were once serious and now you're not. You found your, find yourself becoming lukewarm and you worry about what Revelation says about what God will do when he comes back and finds lukewarm people and lukewarm churches and you don't want to be spit out of the mouth of God. You think, I, I just can't muster it. I can't find it within me. I can't find the motivation. I don't know where is the thing that once burned within me. You need to rediscover the faith of your youth. Like scripture tells us to love men, to love the wife of our youth. That's, that's a That's a... A command to remember. Remember when you were first believing. Remember what he did to save your soul. Remember your life before him. And think about what your life would look not like now without him. That always terrifies me. Because I know who I was. People who have known me the longest know who I was. I don't know where I, I don't know if I'd be living. Frankly, I don't know if I'd be actually alive right now. I don't mean that in absolute earnestness. Some of you, Jesus is waiting on you to, to, to stop playing church. 
And I say that in, in the most, I try to muster the most tender way of saying this. I say it in, in earnestness and, and faith that God is going to help you interpret those words right. I'm not pointing a finger. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And I trust if that's true, he just pointed a finger at you and said, I'm talking to you. Some of you, God is waiting on you to say, you know, you're, you're taking this kind of casual. Do you really believe in me? Is, my, is your life really mine? I gave my life for you, and you want to withhold all of yours from me? Every one of us, at all times, God, I was just convinced of this the more I read Scripture. God is always waiting on all of us for something. Whether it's disobedience of sins, sins we haven't turned over him, things in our life and our past and our hurts and our unfinished business, things we haven't transformed out of, that are an incredible stumbling block to our faith. If we let them exist without saying, Jesus, have it all, cure it all, heal it all. Take this sin away. Take this vice away. Help the things that once tasted so good now to taste like vomit in my mouth. I was struck in my study by the concept that Jesus is waiting on me. But when you place your faith in him, even if you have great sin and you look at your sin, like Spurgeon said, when I see my sin, I need to trust the blood. I trust the blood. Even, even the most crippling fear about meeting Jesus one day that maybe some of you have, a crippling fear. I take by faith that he's, he's the lover of my soul, but I'm still so afraid to meet him. Whatever that is for you, he wants to give you the clean conscience of Hebrews 9. He wants to give you a clean conscience so you can look forward to meeting him. Titus 2 is so beautiful for so many reasons. But I want to show you a passage from Titus 2 that wraps all of this up almost like in one single present. Everything we've been studying in these two chapters. For the grace of God has appeared at the end of the ages bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, because he will appear, who gave himself up to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Man, God's not playing games. He's not playing games with the Great Commission. He's not playing games with the church, and nor should we. What an amazing thing he has done and secured the will he wrote that was enacted when Jesus died. The things you have gained, the eternal, the eternal inheritance you have gained, so much happened when God gave the blood of his son on the altar of the cross. Here's five things, <laughs> and it's not a sermon part two. We will go through these quickly. Know these. I want you to see these five things. Number one, the blood of Christ established covenant with God. And that this is really, at this moment, the sermon is somewhat fading here, and our communion time is, is increasing. Right now, you're entering into a time of communion. So church, prepare your hearts for communion as we read these things. The blood of Christ inaugurated a covenant with our great God. We see that from this passage, Matthew 26. Jesus said, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So when we come to the table, we're acknowledging our sins are forgiven. Number two, the blood of Christ. Are they not on the screen? <laughs> I, that's a lot. Of, yeah, yeah. Do we have the? Do we have them? Okay, we're getting them. Sorry about that, folks. Number two, I'll keep going. They'll be on the screen. Take a picture when they're all up there. We have communion with God. Remember what we already learned. Because of what Jesus has done, the first place in the temple is gone. There's no barrier between us and God. He's gone into the holy places. He's a forerunner, and we are anchored to him where he is. He's calling us to come one day. So we have communion. We gather near. Look at this, Ephesians 2.13. Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, you who wondered, is there any way I can be forgiven? How could God forgive me? You have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Specifically, by the blood of Christ. 
Number three, it cleanses us from sin. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Son, cleanses us from our sin. Walking in the light doesn't mean being a moral person. It means stop hiding your sin. Let your sin come out and let the Bible wash over it. Let the truths of God wash over it. Let the Spirit have his way that by bringing sin into the light, God, the blood of Christ would truly wash away sin and the guilt attached to it. Cleansing from sin. It commences every blessing in Christ. Number four, the blood of Christ. It commences every blessing in Christ. What does that mean? It commences blessings. Blessings begin when you trust in the blood of the lamb. We see this from Ephesians 1. God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Anyone know the next words? They're very Hebrews. In the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is lopped on the new beginner, the new believer, the person who first trusts in Christ. Why? Because when you have Jesus, you have access to every heavenly blessing and you already have the full blessings of heaven. So if you need a second thing beyond that, an experiential worship that feels bigger and, and something and, and a car and, a, and, and all this stuff that we want in the world and health and wealth and prosperity, you're missing the point of the gospel. Jesus is every heavenly blessing. And by trusting in the lamb, you have every heavenly blessing. And you have consecration. These are, by the way, these five things are all from this chapter. This is a summation of chapter nine. We have consecration. What do we, what do we mean? Choosing. You've been chosen. You've been consecrated. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim his excellencies. The blood of Christ did these five things. This chapter teaches these five things. And this is a, I gave you this because when we, I arrived at the end of this sermon, I thought, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way to pack this up. I believe Titus does that, the passage from Titus. And knowing these five things, these have all been taught to you over two weeks. Go back and listen to these sermons again. I implore you because it's all in there. It's all in Hebrews. Study it with your life group and go through these five things. We have covenant with God, which means we approach the table in community with him. We've been cleansed from our sins through the blood and body of Christ given for us. We receive every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and we can trust we've been chosen as his people to now go out those doors and proclaim his excellencies. As when we begin, Wayne Grudem will come minister to us now with a, a short reading. This is, this is how we begin communion. This is how we approach the table this morning. Jesus commanded his disciples, take, eat, this is my body. And as we individually reach out and take the cup for ourselves, each one of us is in act. We are proclaiming, I am trusting the benefits of Christ's death unto myself. I'm trusting that these things are true. When we do this, we give a symbol of the fact that we participate in and share in the benefits earned for us by Jesus. The fact that I am able to participate in the Lord's Supper, indeed, it's because Jesus invites me, he bids me come to the table. It's a vivid reminder and a visual reassurance that Jesus Christ loves me individually and purposely. And when I come to take the Lord's Supper, I thereby find reassurance every week, again and again, of Christ's personal love for me. When I come to Christ's invitation to the Lord's Supper, the fact that he has invited me into his presence assures me that he has abundant blessings for me. In this supper, I am actually eating and drinking a foretaste of the great banquet table of our King in heaven. I come to this table as a, as a member of his eternal family. When the Lord welcomes me to this table, he assures me that he will welcome me to all the other blessings of earth and heaven as well, and especially to the great marriage supper of the Lamb at which a place has been reserved for me. 
And as I take the bread and the cup for myself, by my actions I am proclaiming, I do need you. I do trust you, Lord, to forgive my sins and give life and health to my soul. For only by your broken body and shed blood can I be saved. In fact, as I partake in the breaking of the bread when I eat it and the pouring out of the cup when I drink it, I proclaim again and again that my sins were part of the cause of Jesus' suffering and death. And in this mixture of joy and thanksgiving and sorrow and conviction and deep love for my Savior, it all intermingled, I'm reminded of the beauty of God's love and the importance of the Lord's Supper. 